It's the week ending Saturday the 22nd of July and this is the week unwrapped. In the past seven days we've seen the beginning of Brexit talks in Brussels, the BBC releasing details on how much their stars are paid and Jodie Whittaker revealed as the new Doctor Who. But we're here to bring you some of the stories that passed under the radar this week. Big news, not making headlines right now, but with repercussions for all our lives. I'm Ollie Mann, let's unwrap the week. And joining me from the week's digital team this week are Elizabeth Carr, Ellis, Ashley Wassell and Cameron Tate. And starting the show this week, it is Ashley. What do you think this week will be remembered for? Should soft power Trump protest? Something could happen with respect to the Paris Accord. We'll see what happens. But uh, we will talk about that over the coming period of time. And if it happens, that'll be wonderful. And if it doesn't, that'll be okay too. A certain Donald Trump there speaking at his press conference with Emmanuel Macron at the start of this week. Now, Ashley Macron pulled out all of the stops for the president, which actually confused many commentators on this side of the channel. Why? Well, in this country, we've taken the view that uh, Trump's a monster and should never come here. So mo- there's many, many people who are protesting or are threatening to protest. Uh, and it came out at the weekend that Donald Trump has told Theresa May allegedly, that he won't visit the UK unless we extend him a better welcome, which means if these people stick to their word and protest heavily, he may never come. Well, I mean, what could be better than a state visit, which is what she offered him almost immediately anyway, you know, tea with the Queen? You can't stop people protesting. I think the argument for Trump is he doesn't want the bad press. For the people who are protesting, they don't want to be seen to endorse President Trump and all the views he expressed during the campaign trail and all of this. I think what Macron's proved is that maybe those people are misguided and actually the better way to achieve things is not to ostracise yourself from, some, from the leader of the free world, but rather to try and exercise some soft power. Yes, but our Prime Minister hasn't exactly tried to uh, ostracise herself from Donald Trump, has she? So she, it, it's the public saying, we're going to protest if you come here. It's the French public who didn't protest in large numbers about Donald Trump, because they, it seemed they understood that diplomatically that wouldn't be in their national interest, I guess. Elizabeth, is that what we Brits should be thinking as well? I agree. I think we should be fetching them going. We're at a very critical point in our country's economic future. We need all the mates we can get. Well, we need all the trading friends we can get. And he is the leader of America. Hopefully, he'll only be the leader of America for the next four years, and then someone else will come. So is it worth getting rid of our long-term links with the US just for the sake of four years? Cameron? I think people have got this attitude that if we protest him, he's somehow going to step down and go, oh, clearly I wasn't made for this for this presidency you know he is here for four years and we need to we need to work with him on this i'm someone who would consider going to protest against donald trump and i and it's because i have a visceral emotional reaction because i can't believe that man's president of the usa and i've looked at it and i've thought when people have said in in the news media well you wouldn't protest you know when the president of china came over or or when putin came over and they've got worse human rights records and all the rest of it and that's true i probably wouldn't be on the street for those people but it's because Britain does have a connection with America. They're, they are our closest ally. They are supposed to be the flagship Western democracy. And I just can't help myself. <laughs> so I, what am I supposed to do? I, I feel like I need to get on the street and show Americans that are sensible that they've elected a complete idiot. I understand the point you're making. And, it's, and you know, everyone drew the comparisons, for example, saying that Robert Mugabe was extended a state visit. But of course, you know, Zimbabwe isn't that Im- important in the big scheme of things. Whereas who America elects is very, very important. I guess my riposte to that would be, what do you want to achieve? Because Macron, this isn't just about national interest, Macron is claiming, and in fact Donald Trump in the in the clip we heard seemed to, um, seemed to confirm that he's rethinking now about the Paris climate change deal. Now, the kind of people who protest, protest against Trump are the kind of people probably who want to see the climate change deal succeed, who want to see you know, us succeed in this environmental aim and to, you know, improve the situation with regards to global warming uh, climate change. But if the man's ego is so pathetic that he can't understand that people protesting on the street is evidence of a functioning democracy, but that diplomacy should also be extended and the two things can go hand in hand, that's his problem, isn't it? I mean, you know, I, I support Theresa May inviting him over here. I would also want to go and protest him being here. 
you're of course you're right that people have the right to protest. I'm just I guess I'm just questioning those people on whether or not this is going to achieve what they want it to achieve. Because I think actually what Macron has proved is that this isn't the way to improve the world. It's just the way to show your distaste at something whilst achieving nothing. There's an arrogance about the fact that little Britain can change something in the world by going out on the street and shaking its fist. And I mean, arguably what Macron's proved is that if you take Trump up the Eiffel Tower, he'll put out. I mean, that's extraordinary, isn't it? Everyone's looking at me aghast now, but you get my point, Elizabeth. (laughs) Yes, but Macron has... Sorry, I'm still getting over that mental image. Macron has played it very, very canny. If you look at his choice of words, he has been the ultimate diplomat in this. He's used things like, he said, you know, I'm getting him to return to the field of action against climate change and to play the game of multilateralism. He is using words that appeal to Trump to get Trump to change his mind. We've had Jeremy Corbyn saying we should talk to terrorists. That's how he justified all his dealings with the IRA, all his discussions with the IRA, is that you have to talk to people to get peace. So how can we then turn around and say, but we're not going to talk to Donald Trump, who has been democratically elected, the leader. We may not like it, but he has been. But that is to assume that anyone who's planning on protesting thinks that the British government shouldn't be speaking to the president of the USA. And I don't think that's the case. I think people who are protesting just think he's a dick. Well, there was that petition, which how many people signed it? I think it was at 3.3 million the last time I saw it, saying that he should never have been extended the invitation. So those people clearly think that yes, government those people do. Okay, but, but I, I would suspect there'll be more. I would suspect there'll be people like me who would think about protesting, who think he should be invited over, but that just don't want to make a point to say his politics is particularly grisly and unwelcome. But do we not think the mass protests that happened after he was elected kind of gave him a good kind of chance to reflect on himself and clearly they haven't really done anything but we have there is evidence that people who he has sat down with and spoken to have been able to change his mind a lot like elon musk who was went onto his board he actually said elon tried to change his way of thinking about immigration in the tech industry and it worked he actually managed to change him so you know sitting down and having these discussions Trump's new to this. He's only been in it for a few months. Um, You know, give him a break. And from Macron's point of view, uh, and obviously you're all kind of saying, well, this was obviously good strategy for Macron. What was he trying to achieve? Because it probably wasn't just the Paris Climate Agreement, was it? Well, I think France has had its own travails in recent years hasn't it and it's economically um been sort of regarded as a sick man of europe um a new index came out this week that said that france is now the most influential country in the world whilst america slipped four places it seems to be just a direct response to him shaking his hand for a lengthy period of time and slapping him on the back once but you know clearly this is improving france's standing in the world when britain is going through you know the issues of brexit pulling ourselves out of the eu and now apparently not engaging with the most powerful country in the world we seem to be going the other way yeah and also i mean there's competition isn't there basically always has been between britain france and germany to be the most important country in europe we're dealing with countries like america what macron's just done put france arguably above britain in that list exactly macron did study machiavelli at university as well <laughs> and we have a Good prime fact. we have a prime minister who studied geography <laughs> so she might know where the state is, but that doesn't mean she knows how to deal with them. Uh, I mean, our prime minister versus their president is quite interesting as well, isn't it? Because he is more liberal than Theresa May. So I wonder whether some of the reaction from the public, um, you know, the French public sort of saying, well, I don't agree with Donald Trump, but we should welcome him here and be diplomatic with him. It comes from the fact that they have a figurehead who is more liberal because we have a conservative prime minister it's that little bit harder for people who oppose Trump to see a Conservative and a Republican shaking hands and feel like their views being represented, perhaps. I think we've still got Brexit fever as well. That kind of feeling is, oh, you know, we'll be all right by ourselves. We don't need America. We don't need Europe to do any of this. I'm wondering if that we've still got some defensiveness after post-Brexit. I also don't think Macron's as liberal as he's been made out to be as well. He's, there's a lot of similarities with Trump there. He's spoken out. He doesn't like the press, for example. Um, he's tried to stop them coming to press conferences. He wanted to take certain journalists with him on tours. He wants to make uh, France's emergency powers much more part of everyday legislation. There are a lot of things he's doing which aren't that liberal, He's just an internationalist. 
that that's why we see him as liberal because we see everything through the through the prism of Brexit. Mm. So mm. just as we're retreating from the world stage, uh, France has just elected a leader who wants to enhance their position on the world stage, and arguably you can't do that without embracing America whichever idiot they've elected yeah and equally i mean there are things Theresa may said on the doorstep of number 10 last year that were more socially liberal than what macron stood on weren't they but she didn't win the election <laughs> with the majority <laughs> that means she can actually do them so i guess it is more complicated uh i feel bad to have introduced the word idiot into that discussion cameron don't you think you should never use the word idiot to describe Tom, don don trump's not an idiot is he can i say for the record um he's an ass but he's not an idiot <laughs> He's a clever man. He's uh, I just when Ashley repeated it back to me, I was like, I shouldn't have called him an idiot. He's the leader of the free world. Yeah, that is also a fact. Uh, <laughs> what do you think this week is going to be remembered for? Uh, well, things just got a lot more difficult for teenagers. This is about protecting children, and your research shows that access to this kind of pornography online is changing the way they think about sex and relationships. Many children themselves are saying it's having a negative impact on them. So what we're going to do, if, if we're re-elected, is to ensure that the rules that already exist on the offline world, you know, such as buying pornographic DVDs, they're applied online as well. And the way we're going to do that is insist, you know, through a new regulator, that such websites have age verification in place. So they will have to check in a sensible and effective way to make sure that those people using their websites are aged 18 or over. It's not often that I think about porn and Sajid Javid in the same breath, uh, mm-hmm. but uh, there's a reason because there he was speaking to the BBC a couple of years ago about the Tory plans to regulate pornography online, uh, including asking users for ID to prove that they're over 18. Uh, now, Cameron, this has been you know, a, a reasonably large news headline this week because this is all set to happen in April as part of the Digital Economy Act. We've gleaned that from the week's headlines. So what is it that you want to talk about? Well, this is, this is actually a story that's been going on for quite some time now. I think kind of digging into it, you can, see, you can actually trace it back to 2008 of the Conservatives saying we want to introduce some form of, of stricter... Uh, online pornography regulation and it looks like it's finally going to come in but my question is will it actually work and there's a lot of evidence to suggest that it won't so as mentioned the idea is users will be required to put in their credit card details to be given access to the porn website well that's that's speculation isn't it the idea is that you verify your age Mm. and people are speculating that's really the only way you can do it because you have to be over 18 to get a credit card Uh, but we don't know that's what they'll do it's not confirmed but it's it's widely expected that it will be uh credit cards that will be used because that's the easiest way because it's the it's the only way really of actually verifying someone's age emails you can't do it because you can easily fake your age a credit card is the only way that you can well, passport, guarantee driving license. It's true. You could use a passport, but when have you ever seen passport or driving license details filled in online for ID checks? Well, it's, uh, it's primarily credit cards also, that you use. How would the companies police that? So they'd have to tie their website then into the national database for things like passport details and and driving license. But details, that, that is what car hire companies do, isn't it? If you hire a zip car or something, you have to put in your driving license, take a picture true. of it. That's true. But Cameron, the biggest yeah. porn uh, group in the world are called MindGeek. They're based in Montreal in Canada. They're right. the people who run YouPorn and a whole load of other sites okay. as well. They're behind this. I wonder if that company is getting behind it because they consider it to be inevitable and they want to get a head start because the rule essentially will kick in in April 2018 and anyone who hasn't got those checks in by then could either face a fine or being blocked from your internet service provider. Mm. So I'm wondering if they just want to get the leg up. Plus, if you've got credit card information already then it's very easy to start charging in the future yeah, if you so already have that information. If that may be part of that. Mm. Plus, I mean, it makes it a lot easier to work out what people's personal preferences might be based on their age and where they live and all that kind of thing. Which is exactly the problem with giving your details across in a credit card because you're laying yourself open to some stranger knowing exactly your sexual preferences, what you like to watch, what you don't like to watch. And any future hackers could then just get that information. But can't they do that anyway, Cameron? You write about tech. Isn't it the case that if a hacker wanted to work out what porn someone watches, they just need to, you know, hack their email and then send them a cookie, basically? They definitely could. But if you've got an influx of people putting in their personally because anyone can really go and access pornography without needing to put in any personal information really there are ways in which you can go onto a porn website and put your personal details in let's say if you had a premium account or, or whatever you could put it in but there's no real way of anybody getting your 
credit card details or even really your address from just hacking into a porn website. So if you put this infrastructure in, you're going to have a lot of hacking organizations that are going to think, okay, we're going to have an influx of people putting their credit card details in. When these rules come in, millions of people will do it. And it's going to be just a big kind of dollar sign for hackers. They're going to go, I'm going to jump on that. And also some of those sites presumably aren't that safe either. I mean, they're often fronts for people sending malicious software and stuff, aren't they, in the first place? Mm. I think that's the issue, isn't it? It's not. This isn't about the big global company based in Montreal. This is about the small company based in, you know, wherever around the world in some in some state of America that's operated by, you know, a few pot-bellied men who just, you know, happen to want to put these videos up and usually they're, I'm guessing, like short clips and things like that. This isn't the the main sites doing the big highly produced videos who probably do have a team that can protect any credit card details that are put in it's the small sites that will comply with this legislation in a fairly loose way and you get an Ashley Madison scenario where you know the website gets hacked and all your details are out there and it's suddenly they can get into your credit card okay but is there anything wrong with the government saying Elizabeth this is our aspiration you know we've set a target it's a year away these big companies who are profiting off sometimes children watching pornography because there's no age guards at all, it's their responsibility to come up with a solution. But if you want to sell porn in the UK for commercial gain, you need to protect children from it. What's wrong with the government suggesting that? Because you can find porn without going to any of these sites. You stream programs, kids do, you play games online, you're bombarded with sexual images. A lot of them I blush at. And... I am very hard to blush. Kids are being bombarded with this all the time. Putting in your credit card details to go to a specific site to see porn isn't going to solve the problem. It's just papering over the cracks. There is a lot of images that children shouldn't see. And basically, sorry to be boring, parents should be watching what their kids do online. Well... Yeah, I mean, that's easy to say when you talk about nine-year-olds, isn't it? You're talking about 16-year-old. You know, they're technically under 18, let's be honest. What's he watching on his mobile phone when he goes to bed? You don't want to know, do you? Me and my friend once, back in the early days of the internet, got drunk on a night out in Edinburgh. We came back, decided to have a giggle, look at these sites. She had put the children's control on her computer. We couldn't lift it off. Just to put a child's control on. There yeah. are ch- That's a good point, isn't it, Cameron? There are existing child controls. So should the government actually just be making it a legal requirement that if you're under 18, you're looking at a browser that has one of those on? Exactly. Well, it's, it's a fair point because I think there are just so many better ways of, of doing it than dumping your credit card details in. Uh, one of which is education. Why can't we teach kids about the use of pornography? What's right? What's wrong? Maybe you could in- include it into sex ed. Maybe start at a younger age and... and teach kids look this is on the internet because i can't help but think if you put a block up they will find it somewhere else or you'll find a website that will start it up somewhere else that will become kind of like a a not a very safe place to go kids will find that you can go and get it on social media tumblr yeah there are so many alternatives yeah well okay so let's talk about that as well because you hear that a lot with this debate don't you people say well actually one of the world's biggest porn sites is tumblr because people share short clips on it well why doesn't America have a law to stop Tumblr making it so that you can just share short clips of porn without any attribution to the people that have made it, without paying them, without any protection over who's watching? Why is that a reasonable thing for an American company to provide? They're owned by Yahoo. Why not just stop them as well? I think it's the it's, it's just the impossibility of it again, isn't it? I That's mean, not impossible. Say to Tumblr, stop putting out. But then, but then somebody else would would do it, wouldn't they? I mean, it's it's it's. I mean, when I was a kid, there was always uh, you know porn magazines seem to always be doing the round. Someone had managed to get hold of them, you'd find them down the park. There was there was always ways people got round that that sort of shaky gate protection that was the news agent who would try and make sure you were eighteen. And many of them probably didn't care that much. I just think this this sort of stick approach to trying to um change people's attitudes, this sort of thing. And it's no bad thing to say that people under eighteen shouldn't be looking at certain things. It's, if it doesn't work and it drives people elsewhere, then it's not achieving the stated intent. It seems to me more a bit of virtue signaling to say, look, we're getting tough on pornography. Why not insist that every ISP has to have a, a, a parental check on it and then that puts it in the hands of parents to decide what children are watching rather than setting some very harsh moral limit on what we should, should or shouldn't be doing? Cameron? Well, you've got a lot of kids that are, are really, really good with computers. I've mostly grown up with computers, but there are kids that have started from when they're two or three years old. So they're going to really know their way around. If there is something like this, they'll find their way around it. There is a way of getting around the potential pawn blocks that the UK will put on and most UK censorship as well through something called a VPN, a virtual private network, which is basically a piece of software that emulates, it basically thinks that your computer is in a different country. 
So you can just you could just bypass the checks using that. But it does just make it that little bit less convenient, doesn't it? And and actually, a lot of children think to themselves, oh, if society's telling me I shouldn't do this, maybe I shouldn't. And and that's enough of a nudge, isn't it? You can't smoke anymore indoors, so people have to go outdoors. You know, it's possible to do it, but fewer people smoke as a result. That's much easier to police, though, isn't it? If I light up a cigarette indoors, it's the landlord's responsibility to tell me to get outside. Whereas, you know, you're talking about something that happens in a 16-year-old's bedroom anywhere across the country that even their parents may not know about. It's a silent thing that's happening on the computer. So I think that it's just much, much harder to police. And I can't help but feel the intent to police it, while, you know, in theory, uh, not something we should be against, is being brought forward for the wrong reasons. Plus, me and all my friends smoked when we were 14. Sorry, ma'am. Putting up those sort of rules just makes it more exciting. That's why you do it. And finally, it's our parental control. It's Elizabeth. Uh, What do you think this week should be remembered for? This week showed that some truths are universal and eternal. She remarked famously that it was not a good thing to be uh, an unmarried woman, that they have an awful tendency to be poor. So when she began to earn a little with her books, it was thrilling to her. A wonderful letter to Cassandra, she wrote, I am rich, you know, and she did, she did earn well with her books, it's true. And rather, rather wonderfully, I mean, she, her sister said that late in her life, she rather felt sorry for her married sisters-in-law because they all were, or, and nieces, were all constantly giving birth <laughs> as she was writing her books. Wouldn't it be nice if this podcast had the quiet dignity and etiquette of The World at One? Uh, that was Claire Tomalin on The World at One talking about Jane Austen. Uh, Elizabeth, it's been 200 years since her death. Why are we talking about this now? The Bank of England revealed the new polymer £10 note. Yes, and she's the face of that. We've heard all of that it this week. It is the face of so, that. So what? I find it very interesting that we're celebrating, or marking, sorry, the death of Jane Austen at a time where personally I think women's rights have never been so bad. Well, not never been so bad, but certainly uh, haven't hey, progressed. Let me tell your argument apart. <laughs> <laughs> haven't progressed since Jane Austen died. I think Yes, they have. Women's rights haven't progressed since Jane Austen's death. Come on. Perhaps not rights. That's not the right word. All women women's of voting age can vote. Society- yes, that's it. No, that's not it. What else can we do? Well, you can say if you've been raped and complain about it and the person might go to prison. If you'd been raped and complained about it then. No, no, no. But even within a marriage, that's all changed, hasn't it? You're much more likely to be the CEO of a company. You can have your own bank account. I think in terms of society, women still have it just as difficult as they did in Jane Austen's times. She said herself, I, she I hate to be the man the shouting one. you down, but no, they don't. No, they don't. Look, because it's really hard for... I'm not, I'm not saying it's easy being a woman and that there's equality because there isn't. But it's just spurious to say it's not improved for 200 years. It improves year on year, doesn't it? In what way? Well, we've got a female Prime Minister. How about let's start with that? Who is being hit constantly with misogynistic But, but we had attacks. one 40 years ago, but we didn't have one 200 years ago. So that's a change, isn't it? The woman in the house still has to play the same roles that she played in Jane Austen's times. That has not changed. If anything, I think it's going a bit backwards where women are being expected to take on these roles again. We've had this 20, 25 year break where things got a little bit better and now it's just reversing completely. I wish the fact that an alien with two hearts now has a vagina hasn't become such a huge talking point as it has with the new Doctor Who. I wish Laura Kunzberg didn't have to hire a bodyguard to protect her from misogynists during the election campaign. I wish women got paid exactly the same as men, but they don't. There is so much that I wish for, and that Lizzie Bennet would be fighting for, exactly the same as she was 200 years ago. Ashley? I think the the point Elizabeth's making that probably does have some credence is that perhaps they haven't moved as far as as people like me thought. When I first joined the workplace, I joined a media company. We had more female bosses than male bosses. Uh, Women were just as likely to get promoted. There were more women in my office than than men. At my own house, we've got a child, and we share childcare responsibilities 50-50. We're all very egalitarian. I've got my own liberal bubble. But actually, there is a lot of evidence that there there isn't the equality we thought there was. So 
I, for example, always used to defend the uh, the pay gap statistics, saying, well, you know, women do tend to take a bit more time out. That's just biology more than anything. And But actually, I, I saw a report that said that graduate starting salaries are about 10% lower for women in most occupations. So that's mm. the people qualified to the same degree who just happen to have different genitals getting paid 10% less mm. on average. That's hard to defend. That's hard to say there isn't still equality. However, I do believe we might be hitting a bit of a tipping point. I think actually the fact that we're talking about this so viscerally, the fact we're talking about Koonsberg being at, having some horrible abuse. For that story her. actually did pass me by. What was that story? She had security guards. This is the BBC's during political the editor. Election, she yes. had a bodyguard during the election campaign because she was getting so many online threats. And most of those threats are misogynistic in nature, mm-hmm. of course. Although I, my argument's always been that the the general anger on social media doesn't have a political purpose. If if that if if she happened to be black and a man, she would be it would be racial abuse. I think that's too easy to say. That is just a small minority of men. That is just a certain type of person. It doesn't matter. They're still there. They're still making her life hell in exactly the same way that Austin's heroines had their lives ruined by such men. 200 years later, that hasn't changed. Cameron. And that's what I think social media has done. Because even if it is just a small minority of blokes that are saying this, we right here, unfortunately, we're giving them a voice. So even though it might be one person or two people, we're talking about it. Like you said, Ash, we're kind of on a tipping point. We could go one way and we could say, look, with the rise of social media, things have got to change. We have to pull these people out and say, you're being an idiot. Or it could go the other way. We might be giving these misogynists a platform to elevate themselves. I love the fact they have a platform. I love the fact that they now come out. I sound like Kevin Keegan. I love the fact that they now come out and say it because then we can fight. I think the problem with the feminist movement over the last 20 years is that it's been moved to a because you're worth it. £200 for a foundation? Fantastic. You're worth it. You're a woman. Forget about all the misogyny. You can look great. Now that these people are coming out the woodwork, we can shout out again and people can realise that it's not that easy for women anymore. They still have to fight these people. And they have a voice? Fantastic. Bring it on. Fetch the fight. There is a thing in some of this stereotyping, though. So there's this, the, there's the new another story that came out this week was the, um, the Advertising Standards Agency saying it wants to crack down on stereotyping in advertising. So it doesn't want to see adverts where it assumes that the man can't do housework or where you know the woman's tied to the kitchen and all that sort of thing. What's quite interesting to me, though, is advertisers are broadly, and I'm going to generalise sort of flagrantly here, but they're, they're broadly amoral. They don't care. They're, they want to sell Silit Bang or they want to sell whatever. You know, they're, they're not worried about the impression they're giving. I don't, I don't think in general. Mm. So, and, and actually, I mean, in the past few years, the kind of girls can do it too thing has been a noticeable trend in yeah, advertising. Yeah, and that's because it? it sells. So yeah. that means the other thing, the thing we don't like, the thing we're complaining about, that sells too. So that means there is a portion of the population who still resonate with that. And I'm not saying that's a that's a good thing or a bad thing. I'm just saying that there are, that clearly it does resonate. I mean, my my wife had a, had a child 15 months ago. She's gone back to work. But many of her friends didn't. They immediately decided that they actually wanted to extend their maternity leave and eventually they stayed out of work. So they would be perpetuating all of the wrong stereotypes according to the, the view you're espousing. But that was a, an act of choice. The, one of the great things about equality was we gave everyone choice. Yeah, but it's it's the depiction of the woman whose sole interest is what colour of bleach she's going to use on her carpet that's the issue, isn't it? It's but not I, that she's I, chosen to be at home and really choose the bleach. Are seeing adverts still like that? I know we still see adverts where there's this the, the man who's not as good at housework and things like that, and there's, there's the softer stuff, but the really bad kind of, you know, women have to do the housework and, and men wouldn't dream of it, and that stuff doesn't still exist. I mean, I haven't seen adverts like that. Only now, it's the woman who's just come in from the office and she's had a busy day, and Oh, she has to make f- dinner for the family as well. So let's just get Deliveroo instead, making your life so much simpler, women. Well, you just sold it to me, actually, <laughs> to be fair. Yeah, but men come home uh, and get Deliveroo what well. else hasn't changed since Austin's days? Because, um, I mean, I can't believe I'm asking that question because I'm thinking of lots of things. <laughs> uh, but Jane Austen's novels, they're, they're all about essentially the women marrying themselves off, aren't they? Yes, and that is still... Actually... That's why I think it's very interesting. What she said still applies to how men are treated in society as well. And this is what modern day feminism has forgot is that it's also a fight for men to be equal as well. It's a fight for men to wear the makeup if they want. Poor Prince Harry, he is our truth universal. You know, (laughs) he has a fortune, so therefore he must be in want of a woman. Whose fault's that, though? I mean, the public love those stories. The public love to fantasise about who's going to marry Prince Harry. 
you know, it's not society against its will being told that this is something we should be thinking about. But why does it have to be that way? Why can't we just change it? If you continually tell people this is how it should be, then that's what people expect. You you have written for Hello Magazine, Lizzie. I have written for I Hello mean, Magazine. Is that not part of the I problem I love here? Hello Magazine. I love Hello Magazine. I personally think if Prince Harry came out and was gay tomorrow, Hello Magazine would love it and they'd be showing lovely pictures of him and his boyfriend too. Cameron, should we be harking back to the world of chivalry that we read about in Austin? But doesn't that just enforce... You're a striking young gent. Oh, I thank you, Ollie. Would you like to be a Mr Darcy? I don't like to take steps backwards. And I think going back to an age of where you you kind of enforce chivalry, you could almost say that's sexist as well, really. But if uh, men were more chivalrous online, Cameron, then might that not be a good thing in terms of setting the tone for conversation and achieving Elizabeth's utopia of, well, of sheer equality? I guess it depends on how you would, you would define chivalrous, because I think there's a lot of support for women online but i think a lot of that support gets covered up by the handful of trolls that do say terrible things because they're the people that we talk about relatively speaking the whole social media online trolls is still a relatively new phenomenon i don't think you would see much change for 10 20 years because it's something that's got to really it's something that's got to be enforced over a long time wouldn't it be lovely if we were all just chivalrous to each other male or female if people were just nice chivalrous we probably wouldn't have this problem, but that's not the way the world works. I think that was the moral of Emma, wasn't it? I don't know, I've only seen Clueless. But uh, anyway, thank you very much. That is it from this edition of The Week Unwrapped. My thanks to Elizabeth Carr Ellis, Ashley Wassell and Cameron Tate, all of whom are very eligible for marriage. For more from The Week, why not visit theweek.co.uk. You can download our free iPhone app, The Weekday, or you can get the magazine direct to your door. Just head to theweek.co.uk slash subscribe. Uh, And you can find every episode of this fine podcast wherever you get your podcasts. Just search for The Week Unwrapped. I've been Ollie Mann. Our music is by Tom Morby, the producer Matt Hill at Rethink Audio. Until we meet again to unwrap next week... Bye-bye.